Well, I guess what I'll start by saying that uh, for me, as, as I thought about implementing Holacracy in our organization, the, the, one of the things I had to consider is how do we measure uh, the progress? How do we measure uh, you know, the outcomes? And as I thought about that problem, there's really a lot of different dimensions of measurement. And so what you heard yesterday was some conversation around how do we measure the actual results of, of the experiment that we're running for a year. But there's other types of measures as well. There's measures internally, I think, that we all as implementers think about, which is there, and we talked about yesterday uh, in the sort of the debrief, a lot of sessions, I think a lot of groups talked about, we talked about it at our table, where really the one of the big challenges is making that cognitive shift in people's minds. And that's really sort of the challenge that we have as implementers is making that cognitive shift. And so the question is, well, how do you measure that cognitive shift if that's actually the goal? How do you know what it is today, and how do you know what, what you know what the progress is, and and whether the shift has actually been made? And you know, keeping in mind that you can't really change those things you can't measure. So you want to come up with a measure to change those things. So um, one of the this is a uh, this is a, a slide that I use to talk about some of the outcomes of the experiment. So you heard yesterday really the construct of the experiment. And you know, it created a lot of constraints, and it was probably the worst way to try to implement holacracy. I wouldn't recommend doing it. But the from that, you know, we, we started to collect some data, and there was also some other data that we captured. So this is just one slide to talk about some of the outcomes that we saw because I felt like it was maybe a little bit lacking in terms of um, uh, data that you guys are looking for. So for example, there are two metrics that we've been measuring for the past couple years uh, in our teams, which is the uh, it started out as a happiness metric. And because I come from an agile mindset, so I thought I could measure velocity and I can measure uh, happiness. But as it turns out, in the authorizing environment in government, uh, people don't care about happiness because you're a government worker, you're here to get things done, and we don't pay you to be happy. So I've changed that term. I don't call it happiness now, I call it the empowerment metric. And uh, every week for the past two years, what we've been measuring is, is the degree of empowerment. And the way we measure it is we do a, a fist to five every week in our tactical meeting. And we ask the question, to what degree do you feel empowered to resolve your own issues within the organization? And people respond with, you know, five being, yes, I'm fully empowered, I can resolve my own issues, to a one, I feel completely disempowered. And that metric went from 60% to 90%, so we saw a 50% improvement. The other thing we measured was velocity, and essentially it was, uh, how long does it take to bring up an issue, discuss it, and resolve it? In the very beginning, it took us 20 minutes to uh, bring up an issue, discuss it, and resolve it. And now, and for quite a while, our average time to bring up an issue, discuss and resolve it is two minutes. And uh, that's, so those are a couple of metrics as well as some of the uh, testimonials that we've captured, and some of that comes from the, the uh, qualitative data that Mike Lee discussed. And then we've also, we also measure, the remember the goal that was presented yesterday was around uh, recruitment retention. Can we create an environment that attracts talent and retains them? And there's, I won't go into details on how we do this, but because there's not enough time. Um, but we know from the data that we've collected that changing the work environment, including self-management, uh, has created a 10 to 25,000 or 10 to 20,000 dollar value proposition per employee, or about a $10 million value proposition across the state. All right, so I just wanted to touch on this. I had this slide literally five minutes ago based on some questions I heard. I thought it might be useful. But the main point of today's talk is I wanted to go a little more detail in how we actually measure the, the, um, the implementation and the, the, at a team level, how well they're doing with Holacracy. Are they making that mental shift? So we started off with the vision around, okay, this is something we want to shift as we make the implementation. So what's our vision on what it is that we're trying to capture? And you saw actually the current version of this, of this particular slide, but uh, essentially what that vision looked like is we had a year to do this experiment and we wanted to get the teams from a zero level maturity to a high level maturity as possible within this one year period. So essentially what we wanted to do is the teams would start out down here somewhere and by the end of the experiment, ideally we'd like to have them be up here in this 100% you know, maturity uh, by the end of the year. Okay, that was the aspirational goal. I say now in hindsight that was aspirational goal because we didn't actually achieve it. Uh, that was a joke, okay. <laughs> so, we developed a, a rubric um, uh, for uh, assessing teams, and this was a team level rubric. 
This rubric was cribbed from a couple of different sources, including, now if you're taking a picture, I'm actually gonna give you a link to this rubric, you can download it. So, oh uh, yeah, that's at the end. That's at the end, so you have to stay here for the entire time. <laughs> All right, so uh, this is, uh, there are six criteria in the rubric. Uh, governance, operations, facilitation, empowerment, decision-making, and focus on purpose. And the rubric was cribbed from a few different sources. One of them is the uh, organizational self-maturity, self-management maturity map that came from Holacracy One. Uh, that is That assessed maturity across the organization, but what I needed in order to assess maturity at the team level throughout the experiment is you know team uh, level uh, metrics. So I grabbed a few of the items from that, and then uh, I also grabbed from another source uh, better measures around facilitation. And each one of these uh, six, and the other thing I did is I, I uh, de-holacrosized the, uh, the terminology. So what, obviously, as, as holacry practitioners, we recognize this, but what you won't see in any of the rubric, or you won't see the word holacracy, you won't see the word lead link, you won't see those words that are uniquely holacracy. One is because of the communication challenge in trying to you know, talk about this outside of us as practitioners. But second, I was trying to make it a little bit more you know, broadly uh, usable. So the, but each one of these criteria has a separate, uh, you know, more detailed level from zero to four. And uh, this, this rubric, what it allowed us to do is it gave us a standard for all the coaches to use. And we had uh, paid coaches from Locksy One and Thought Floor Partners helping us. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. So that was, that was a rubric. The second step was we had, to come, we had to come up with a way to actually monitor and measure the teams. So the obvious, one obvious uh, method is uh, leveraging the coaches that are in the rooms, helping you know, facilitate initially and then coaching the teams. But we also partnered with the local university, the uh, Evergreen College that's in our area, and they have a master's of public administration. And they came in, I mentioned yesterday that we do tours uh, every Monday, and they came in as one of our tours, and they were blown away that this was happening in government. And about half a dozen of them volunteered their time to help us with the experiment. And they, we called them um, circle watchers. And some people call them creepy circle watchers. <laughs> but there was a role called circle watchers that, and their role essentially was to sit in on the meetings and capture data about uh, those teams and you know, how well, use that rubric to measure the performance of those, of those teams. So then the third step was to collect all the assessments. So we had uh, coaches, paid coaches, we had circle watchers. I also had some of my team often will participate in these uh, various team meetings. We had about 15 or so teams, and sometimes I'm in there. So all of us are assessing the, the, the circles. And we used a particular tool called Decision Lens, and we used it because that's what we had, and it, it solved uh, this particular problem. So what we had is uh, from the, either a phone or from their laptop, they could go, here's, this is a particular circle, the HR portfolio circle, uh, this criteria facilitation, and the person scoring it would just push the button to, you know, is it zero through four? And it automatically jumped to the next criteria. And at any time, if they want, if they weren't clear, what the heck was level three again? They could jump over uh, in that same screen and, uh, and get a little more, get a pop-up that explained what level three was. In addition to scoring it, this was also a place where the coaches and the circle watchers, myself and others that were doing this, we could also comment, we could store comments for that particular circle. And it allows us to communicate in real time. And, and also I could you know, view the comments and kind of see what was going on as an implementation lead. The, uh, the, then what this provided, as they, that data was being collected, in real time what I could see is for each of the circles, what's their maturity? So this is essentially the maturity from zero to one. And each of these colored pieces are one of, one of the six criteria. So there's six different bars there. Uh, so we could see, you know, at a, at a whole, what's the maturity of those of the circles. Now, what the the uh, scores would do is in, and we would capture these scores once a month. So what they do is they attend or observe a meeting, and they would assess those that circle uh, against those criteria. And then the next week, let's say they were in the next tactical meeting, and they go there and they pull up the exact same criteria. They could see their scores from last time, and they would just modify it. Maybe they saw something new that, oh, actually that bumps up their maturity. I'm really starting to see the lead on behave a particular way. And they would do this throughout the month, just modifying their scores. And then at the end of the month, I would look and capture the results, and then we just re reset it and start the next month. Okay. 
So then what I would do is I, would, I could also go in and look at what's, what's called an alignment, which I could see how, to what degree do all of the assessors actually agree on the assessment of that, of that circle. So if there's a one, that's 100%, that means that everyone scored in this particular, here are the, the circles uh, as rows across the top are the criteria. So for this particular cell, the that, uh, circle number eight, all the, all the assessors agreed 100% on their assessment of the governance criteria. And what I would do is I would use this to help me focus in on what are those criteria where there was a high degree of variance. So in this particular case, the EDN provisioning circle, uh, there was a pretty low alignment in the facilitation score. And I would, that would help focus my attention as the limitation lead, and I could look at those things that are there, there are some discrepancies. Then I could go in and see for a particular EDM provisioning facilitation, how, who are the, the people who assessed that circle and how do they score them? And I'd make some judgments. Sometimes what it involved was I talked to the individuals to understand you know, why they scored them at that level. Sometimes it's just because they, they were in one meeting and it just happened to be a bad day for that circle. Because um, you, know, you're, you don't have all these people observing every single meeting every single time, right? So it just, it's kind of spotty that way. Um, is Nick Osborne in the room? No? Oh, okay. Nick Osborne was one of the, one of the assessors down here. Oh, he abstained, apparently, for that one. <laughs> uh, so this, and sometimes what I would do is I would adjust the scores. If I saw a intern, one of these, you know, uh, free um, helpers from Evergreen, if, if I saw all the paid coaches giving them a particular team a level two, and then an intern gave a four, I'm gonna be fairly dismissive of that, that little four score. But it also pointed out where there was some discrepancy and I'd work with those interns to help them, um, you know, to have a conversation to understand, you know, why they score at that particular level and then give them coaching on how to assess. Uh, so then, uh, after, after I've done any, any, applied any judgment and modified those scores, I could, you know, generate this report and it would show me all the, all the circles it would show me for each of the criteria how many points. Now, what's interesting is that when we share the points, it's, it's not obvious what's going on here. But if you think about it, the total maximum score a circle can get is 100%. There are six criteria. So you take 100% and you divide by six. That gives you around 17, uh, 0.17. So that's the most you can get in any one criteria is 0.17. But that 0.17 is also, it can be from zero to four, or one to five, if you will. So it's, you know, those, those are the different increments. When you add them all up, you get the final score here uh, for each of the, the circles. That's kind of what's going on. It's actually way more sophisticated and complicated than that, but uh, we'll get into that. Uh, so then I would, now that would give me an assessment for a month. But what I really need is an assessment for the entire year so I can monitor progress. So I move those scores into uh, a Google Sheet in this case. So I could track month by month, how are the teams doing? And then that easily allowed me to then put that into a, a chart, which you guys have already seen, like this. So this is, uh, and I, this is the most current, I haven't updated it with the April month, uh, April data yet. So this allowed me throughout the experiment to track what is the maturity of a particular, uh, of a particular circle. And really, for, as an invitation of lead, what it allowed me to do is focus in on the circles I need the most help. Uh, limited resources, so the circles that are really doing well, you know, that's great, but I want to I look at the circles that maybe need some additional coaching. And what we would do is, uh, uh, we, well, that's the next step here, I'll tell you about it in a second. But what's, what's kind of fun is I've, uh, there is a, a chart I've made before called the, what I refer to as the trough of suck, and I touched on it yesterday. But you can look at, like, here's the, this triangle, they're doing really super well. They're, you can see the enthusiasm, and they're, they're, um, they're really getting into it. Things started to get kind of sucky, and then they dipped down in this trough of suck, and then we came back up, and here's that second dip. And you see that pattern with multiple teams. And some of them experienced the trough of suck later, and some of them experienced it you know, quite early. Uh, some of them, it wasn't quite deep. And so it was really kind of, uh, the trough of suck was just a concept I made up in the very beginning to explain to manage the organizational change piece of this work with employees. As they were sort of feeling this, I was trying to explain what they were feeling and what to expect. It was interesting to, and this is totally happenstance, that it kind of uh, bore itself out in actual data. 
Uh, so I thought that was kind of fun. Yeah, sure. Uh, I think uh, I think in uh, it was translated to French, and it was like "profit de passion" or something. I can't speak French, but uh, it's basically a um, the uh, it's a tongue-in-cheek. Uh, who asked the question? So I can. I'm sorry. Okay, it's a tongue-in-cheek uh, reference to how people feel when they're going through this uh, their halakshi experience and. Or right off the bat, I notice there's a pattern where people get there's some people get really excited about the, you know this new opportunity, and they get really um, um, optimistic about what can happen, and they get really energized in the room, and they start to learn it. Uh, but then, as they start to do real work, and they haven't quite learned all the process yet, things get really hard, and they get um, it, it's very painful. Trough, trough is a is a is a, yeah. adult, a dip. Yes. Okay, so trap trap was the word, not the word suck. Okay, <laughs> yeah, a trough a trough is a is a dip. Yeah. All right. Uh, so we would I would use this data myself and the coaches, and we it would help us focus on what are the issues we need to triage within the implementation because there's just so many teams, there's there's so many things to to we could possibly do, but the end goal was to try to move the teams from the lower left to the upper right, you know, what's, you know, what the, you have to be able to measure that to know how you're doing <laughs> and, and figure out how to triage that. So it allowed us to steer uh, as, as, as we need to. The other thing that kind of that came up that was just sort of uh, interesting, it wasn't intentional or wasn't uh, planned in advance. Uh, first of all, I'm a very agile kind of guy, so nothing is planned in advance. I mean, just barely. Uh, like I said, I was modifying these slides five minutes ago. So uh, this was kind of fun. And the what I noticed was about six months in, uh, one, two, three, four, five, five months in, the experiment, there was people were losing momentum, they were losing energy. So it was one of the issues we're trying to triage was how do we build that energy? And we decided to gamify it a bit, and we came up with so we had these these points, and we were sharing this data with the team so they could see it, although no one really paid attention to it, until we started to uh, gamify it. And we came up with five awards you could potentially win. And I bought some cheap awards off Amazon, like 99 cents or something, and give them to them. I just a little sticker, I put their circle name on it, hand them out. So the first award was the most creative name they could come up with. And we'd assess you know, each month what are the new roles created and most creative name. Uh, the second one was most improved circle. We now have numbers, so we can actually measure that. It's pretty easy. Leading the pack. The circle that's at the top the performance. Uh, most issues processed, that was behavior we're trying to reinforce. But the, the ward that most, I shouldn't say most, the ward that was, um, uh, that a lot of teams really aspired to, and it was sort of tongue in cheek, was no longer last. <laughs> and it was a way of bringing the bottom up, as well as motivating you know, people at the bottom. It can be very demotivating uh, to be at the bottom and given the words for those at the top. So we came up with this award, no longer last, and that was the one that people were the most proud of, of having. Uh, let's see. So this is essentially the process we went through for measuring you know, those steps. And uh, I wish I did more to gamify things, because that's a lot of fun. Uh, but it you know, doesn't necessarily happen. There's that link at the bottom. And I'll leave it on there so you can write down, take a picture of it, whatever you want to do. Um, but okay, so that is it. Great. Questions. Well, look at all those cameras, man. <laughs> I was going to say, let's give them a round of applause, but hands are being used for picture taking. Well, why don't I, I can take a picture and tweet it. Then you guys just look on Twitter. And when you put your phone down, let's give Michael a round of applause. Thank you. Yeah, and I'll be running Mike. Questions. In that link, could uh, we, we find the whole presentation? Uh, <laughs> no, um, the uh, I didn't get it, I didn't have enough time in those five minutes, so I was modifying my deck to add that. But I can certainly. Uh, uh, is there a way? I'm not sure what the plans are here in terms of uh, presenting the. I don't know what you're actually, but uh, if you have it ready or willing to share, you can make sure. I tell you what, I will do. If you follow me on Twitter, right here, I will tweet the link to the deck. Okay. 
Wonderful. Thank you. Hi. Uh, I have two questions. The first, uh, the first question, how many questions uh, you have for this week? How many? How many questions do I have? Yeah, I mean this week. Because it's like the online survey, right? Survey. Survey. Oh, survey. The, the Harvard survey? Uh, how many questions? Like 90. So uh, my question is that if I involved, I have 10 roles uh, involved into 10 different circles. Basically, I, I need to do it 10 times per month. I guess I'm missing the question. I'm not understanding. Say, say again. So if I'm uh, involved into 10 different oh, yes. circles. Yeah. And because this is a monthly survey, right? Yes. Oh, it's not a survey. So this is what I was just describing was there are people that were working with me on the implementation team that would sit in on meetings uh, and observe the behavior. Uh, so from the people that are engaged in the circles, they, I mean, they know this is happening, but there's no additional work for them. Okay. So, so this, this is observed behavior. Okay. But just the only during the meeting. Just in the meetings. Uh, okay. Got you. Yes. Sorry. The second question is that uh, uh, for those is the, I mean, uh, the teams, I mean the circles who have the higher, I yeah. mean the uh, score, yeah. uh, are they also, um, I mean, showing the better performance? Yes, generally speaking. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, the ones that are scoring the highest are the ones that um, not only scored well in the rubric, of course, but they also are the ones that are the most engaged. Uh, they are the ones that had the, the best behaviors uh, in Halachi type behaviors. Uh, the ones that were at the bottom tend to have either lead link ex-manager issues or interpersonal kinds of issues, or they necessarily weren't really excited about doing the whole thing anyway. And they're passive, you know, I mean, just actively disengaged or passively disengaged. Hold on a second, I got this question right here. Can we do this question right here first? A short question. I think you're an inspiring leader to, to implement this and to inspire others. Uh, did you use or did you appoint champions or other people within the organization to help you inspire other people? Or did you do it all by yourself? Or um, the Later on in the experiment, once we were able to, myself and our, our coaches, once we were able to assess those individuals in the organization that seemed to have an affinity for the work, we created a peer coaching um, uh, system and those essentially became champions. Which, you know, they still are champions within the organization. How many did you need? On how many people? Basically, we have uh, about ten uh, peer coaches, so almost about eighty percent of the number of circles. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to understand um, what we can uh, apply from this sure. for uh, daily work because it seems like this is an expensive way of monitoring the progress. You need people to observe, uh, like, right. spend their time observing the circles. Right. Um, is, that, is that actually useful? I mean, is it not? It's probably useful. Is it realistic? Uh, right. And is there other ways to, to measure it? Sure. So um, it was, so it ended up not being, um, so in terms of the expense side, paid coaches were already there. So we already had coaches in the room helping build up the team. So it's just leveraging. Uh, resources they already had. Uh, the the we used the probably the next largest set of resources around these interns. These were free interns. So from a cost perspective, they weren't costing anything. We've evolved past that now, where it is individuals within the organization that are peer coaching, and so they're for them it's a professional development opportunity as well as for me it's an opportunity for to get insight into each of those circles. So it's it's not really. I mean, so that's one way to, to implement it. Where it's not that costly, right? And so, as peer coaches, they get a chance to. Uh, and in fact, in some cases, the peer coaching was way more effective than the paid coaching because they understand the culture of the organization way much better. Uh, they are they're often um, listened to more because they're they're peers, they're colleagues that they know and trust, uh, and also they're they're colleagues that are uh, less. Um, they're less concerned about offending a client. So if they have some direct feedback, they'll just provide the direct feedback. Whereas the paid coaches, you, you, you know, there's some concern there, I think. Um, so that's kind of how we're doing it now, and it's not very costly because it's also um, developing those individuals. Very cool question here. Okay, I have uh, two questions. First is um, you had internal and external uh, observers in the circles, but coaches were just internal in the, uh, afterwards. The uh, the coaching 
uh, role evolved throughout the experiment. In the very beginning, the coaches were paid coaches from Holacracy One and Thoughtful Lord, as well as myself and a couple other people that we uh, there's a, a team of us that have been practicing Holacracy for a year before this experiment. And, and they're, in fact, they're at the top of that, that chart. They're, we also monitor that, that group as well. Uh, then we transition to internal coaching, peer, peer coaching, and those are, yeah, internal. And the second question would be, what about the software? Did you develop it? And no. No. And it's not open source, isn't it? No, no, it's not open source, and it's, it's quite expensive. We have, the software is, is called Decision Land. It's about $200,000 a year. It's expensive. We used it because that's what we had already, and it, it was an effective tool for solving the problem that I need to solve. Uh, it's kind of a big tool to try to solve it, right? But the, the um, but I think the concepts are still valid, right? And and then the concepts are around how do you collect information from multiple um, sources and not try to get to consensus on scores, but sort of commingle those, you know, integrate those scores. Yeah, I was just wondering, uh, how did you use the data with the circles? Do you use it as metrics? Do you have reflections on the data? Or the data itself? Yeah. Yeah, I use the data in a couple of different ways. So as an implementation lead, it's a way that I can help um, prioritize our resources to focus on teams. That's really the, the original intent. It's also used, uh, later we ended up using it as an incentive system for the team themselves. It became a little bit of a competition. And uh, thirdly, the rubric itself is used by the teams so they can do some self-assessment. And or they themselves can look at it, where, where we, we, you know, where we're strong, where we need to improve. So it has those multiple uses, but the primary use in the beginning was really around how is implementation lead, how do I triage, you know, where I spend my finite resources on which teams. Do you use it as metrics in the service, or? Oh, with metrics, you're talking about the metrics in the holacracy sense? No, no, there's other metrics we're capturing uh, with them. Just a quick question for you, Michael. Yeah. Now, did you have any correlation to the size of each of the circles to, you know, how that graph tracked as far as who was who was doing well and who was not doing well? Size wasn't the if, if size has any correlation, it's not a significantly strong correlation. The the strongest correlations uh, in performance is more about the the culture or the dynamics within the team. Uh, we saw the ups and downs of yes. this process. Yes. Um, do you have like a conclusion of what what were why were the ups? Uh, oh, what down. were the downs? And, yeah. Part of it. Um, part of the reason why it's it's it goes up and down is noise, uh, and it's it's uh, you have limited data. So one of those data points might only have, um, you know two or three people that are scoring it and they saw one or two meetings. And you can have good days and bad days as a team. And so there's, I didn't really pay a lot of, I didn't care too much of a team, very a little bit, uh, because there's just noise in the, the data itself. Part of the other um, reason why there's ups and downs is because teams in the very beginning, like I said, it's, it's that um, people get excited about it, they get energized, they get really engaged in a positive way. But once they start to struggle with the process, uh, it's they can they start to engage in a negative way, and it causes you know poor, and so behaviors you're observing are negative behaviors. Um, there are some other teams. There are a couple of teams. Mike Lee talked about them yesterday, where there were there's two teams on that chart where the uh, part of the work is actually being done in another group that's in the control group. You can't talk to one another, right? And so those teams saw a lot of ups and downs. As they are having, um, as they're dealing with that particular issue, uh, but there, there are two like that. Uh, how did it change your, you personally, maybe? How did this the, the rubric implementation? The implementation? Uh, I think I got more gray hairs. Um, <laughs> no, I think the the how the implementation. I'll tell you, it's really draining. So. Um, uh, literally every week, I, I fight for this experiment because there's so many external uh, pressures that I have to, to manage. That are like, you know, it's, it's a challenging thing. Um, but what what inspires me through this experiment is the change I see in some of the individuals. 
and that there are some individuals that are just drawn to the ability to, um, to have a voice and have really elevated themselves in the organization. And I think that's phenomenal. So as a leader, those are the things that I kind of gravitate to. Um, the way it's changed me, I'm not sure, maybe it has changed me, maybe I just don't know how it changed me. But um, it's, I'm glad we're at near the end now. I'm glad we did it. I'm not sure I'd do it again. Um, if I've never done it before, I might still do it the first time, but I wouldn't do it twice. Um, it, it's just extremely laborious. And, but at the same time, there's a lot of people that are positively affected by it. So that's... Michael, I had a question for you too. So yeah. you talked about this dip, the, yeah. the trial suck. Any idea of what turned it up, right? What, any, what were the indicators, anything sure. from the data that showed why? Well, it's, it's the, the typical thing, which is people get better at using holacracy to solve their tensions, right? I mean, we all experience it where, uh, particularly in governance, where um, people get excited about the concepts of holacracy, but then once you actually try to process a real tension, uh, in, in um, particularly in governance, the, the mechanics and the process and all the rules sort of get in the way, you know, from their perspective. And it starts to come up once people understand the, um, once people understand how to use holacracy to resolve their tensions. But that's, that just takes time yeah. to, to pick that up. I was thinking too, like any, any other you know, like concrete, because I know because you did so much with the data and, you yeah. know, Anything kind of what? What are some of the indicators that people are doing that? You know, any sort of observable indicators that the group is processing more stuff? Is processing more stuff? Well, whatever those indicators are, right? Yeah. So one example that came to my mind is when I see circle members bring agenda items and they just say, "Yeah, what I need is yeah. this," or "Yeah, this is an informational item," right? Like they're starting in their own language to frame. You know, so that's an indicator of like, okay, they're starting sure. to get it. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's probably, there's lots of those. Uh, one of the, the gaps, well, there's several gaps in this rubric that we created. So one of the gaps is that it really focuses on meetings. Tactical governance meetings is focus on behaviors outside of meetings. Uh, and behaviors outside of meetings became a significant issue we were trying to triage. So there were, we created a second rubric, which had like 26, 24 measures that totally failed. Because it's, it's, you know, even myself, I couldn't keep track of all of the, but it became a, um, a, uh, a, a tool for the peer coaches to use in order to provide feedback. But in that, in that tool, there were those kinds of behaviors. So which is like there's a, there's a measure there on what percentage of the issues uh, brought up are from the lead link versus, actually it's not from that, it's, it's is, the, is the issues brought up proportional to the roles. So if you have 80% of the roles in a circle, you would you know, assume that you have 80% of the issues. And so that's like one, you know, particular measure that we're looking at to see are people really bringing up issues proportional to the number of roles they have? Because what you see is a lot of, lead, a lot of often lead links have the, bring up the multiple roles. Yeah. So there's, there's a ton of those, and it's not necessarily any one. It's just it's a whole collection. The creepy interns oh. that were involved, were they also in Glass Frog? Did they also yeah. have representation in the organization? Yeah, they are, they are in Glass Frog. So we add them to Glass Frog. There was roles um, called... We didn't call them creepy interns. We called them uh, circle watchers. So they were in the implementation circle, and they had, yeah, they are represented there. Absolutely. Cool. Great. All right. Another round of applause, please, for Michael. Thank you very much.